still Shani, the deputy head teacher here. And thank you, I cannot thank you enough uh, for giving us this opportunity. Uh, these two boys in particular are very excited about it. Um, it's the first time we've ever interviewed anyone connected to space here uh, at Brick Hill. So this is, this is it's the first of hopefully <laughs> any famous interviews. So thank you so much. Um, Calvin, do you want to introduce yourself? So say your name um, and why don't you say a fact about you? Um, yeah, I'm Calvin and I like to play football and I'm really interested about space. Perfect. And good Calvin? combination, good combination. Me too. I'm interested in space and football. I'll ask which team is space. Which team do you support? Well, I'm Portuguese, so I support Benfica Lisbon. Ah. But, but I do enjoy uh, British football as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Not, not over the last few days, though, hey? <laughs> crazy, crazy what's going on. Right, Callum, your turn. I'm Callum. I like playing tennis. I'm, I'm really interested to hear the answers of our questions of space. Sure. <laughs> yeah, so uh, my name is Lucy. I'm French um, and I've been working on one of the instruments on solar orbiter particularly, which uh, is called STIX and is an X-ray telescope. Yeah, sure. I, yeah. Uh, and I like space as well. I've I've been um, since I've finished my my studies. I've been flying spacecrafts. So I flew a spacecraft in Venus, and I and I was working on this solar orbiter mission while it was being developed for a while. And then I started flying four spacecrafts together called Cluster, and they're also looking at what the sun does to the Earth. And um, now I'm also preparing to fly another satellite called Space Rider which is a satellite that can bring instruments in space and then come back down and bring this, this instrument back down to the ground so we can have a look at it. Very interesting. So imagine that, flying, flying a, a, a machine all the way to Venus, on Venus. Very exciting. Right, Calvin, are you ready for the first question? Mm -hmm. Go for it. Okay. How much years does it take like to study for like, to be like what you are? <laughs> how many um, years we need to study, right? That's the question. For myself, I have a PhD and that took eight years of studying um, after high school is finished, so at the university. Uh, it was mostly five years of really studying and then the three last years, uh, it was also training in research. So I was not uh, still uh, learning things um, in front of the back, uh, uh, in front of a teacher, I was really learning my job as a researcher. Uh, so that was uh, kind of I was still considered as a student, but I was already kind of working as well. And so uh, that was the most in interesting part, I would say. <laughs> uh, but yeah, so it's a bit long, but it's uh, really interesting. So I, I started school when I was six, and I finished when I was twenty-three, and then I went to work. So that's how long. And by the time I finished, I was an engineer. Thanks for that. I'm going to ask the next question. Do you think it is possible for it to get closer than 44 million kilometers? So the question is, can we get closer than 44 million kilometers to the sun? <clears throat> well, we are already very, very close with this spacecraft. That's kind of the closest anybody has ever been to the sun. And getting much closer than this gets very, very, very hot. So we have to be very careful there. Uh, in, but in theory, it would be possible if we built a spacecraft that was uh, suitable for closer uh, ranges to the sun, which is not the case for this one. That's, that's as close as we can get. Okay, thanks for telling us. And um, how does the um, the satellite like withstand the temperatures for like the sun? How does it not melt? Yeah, it's a very good question. It, that was a big problem for this satellite. In fact, the whole design, the whole building of this satellite was 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 around this same question: How do you prevent it from melting? So the solution that the engineers found is they built a shield in front of the satellite. 
So this has several layers of material that uh, insulates, the, so it keeps the body of the spacecraft um, away from the heat and, uh, and then dissipates this heat into outer space. So with this shield in front of the satellite, we are very well protected. But it also means we have to be very, very careful that we don't off-point the satellite uh, from the sun, because otherwise the sun would be hitting the body of the spacecraft, which is behind the shield. So this forces us to all the time permanently be looking at the sun with a shield in front of us. Yeah, I think one of the uh, difficult thing was also because we have telescopes on the spacecraft, we need to have small holes in that uh, shield because we need to look at the sun. And so um, that's the big difficulty here to have the shield uh, still be working perfectly fine while we have some holes in it to look at the sun. And uh, I think that's the, the beauty of Solar Orbiter is to have managed that. That's really unique. Thank you. Um... What kind of material of the satellite to make it like not get like burnt from the sun? Um, the satellites are, are um, insulated from heat using what we called um, multi-layer insulation material. And these are sheets of, um, of a special material with, which is then coated with different colors, depending on what we want to achieve. If we want the spacecraft to fly close to the sun, then we need the material to be um, radiative. It needs to expel heat. So the body of the solar orbiter behind the shield is black, because black is a good color to get rid of, of heat if the sun is not shining on it. If the sun shines on it, then it has the exact opposite effect. It will absorb a lot of heat. So other satellites that are uh, in very hot areas uh, and are exposed to the heat of the sun directly, they don't have shields, then they use a different color like gold, because gold is very reflective. And will so instead of that heat coming inside the satellite, it will be reflected back into space. So you will see this material being uh, used with different properties, different colors, for example, to, to, to give the effect, to, to give the thermal um, effect that we want on the satellite. We have another one that goes quite close to the sun. It's called Bepi Colombo, and it's flying towards Mercury. So it's going to be quite close as well. And that one is white, um, which is also a good color to reflect the light. How do you control it? Is it like a more control or something? Um, uh, Oh, I, th I thought I had a controller here right next to me, but uh, well, no, we don't use an Xbox controller or or uh, like you see in a in a in a game console. We 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 control it remotely, so we we have to send a radio signal to it. So at at that far that at, up to that point, it's pretty similar to controlling a remote device. So we need to send radio signals to it, which and it and the satellite is quite far away, so it actually takes several minutes for us to send an instruction to the satellite. But then what we do is uh, we, we have a computer and in that computer, we program these digital packets, these this packets of information and we put it in a, in a, we call it a packet and we radiate this through the antenna. And when the satellite picks it up, he decodes it, finds this digital information and inside there, there's an instruction. And the satellite just has to read what that instruction is and then do it. And we can tell it also at what time he should do that, that instruction. So we can give it a, like a, a time um, a timestamp. That's what we call it. And then, and then the satellite will look at that timestamp and says, okay, I'll wait until that time. And when that time comes, I'll do this instruction. So the satellite is a very autonomous robot in space. And it's quite smart in the sense that you can tell it instructions, it will understand those instructions and will follow them. And in those instructions includes all, all the observations that Sophie and, and her colleagues want to make. Yeah, exactly. And for us, we, we prepare those instructions uh, well in advance. So it's not, uh, we don't uh, get up out of bed and thinking, oh, we will send this comment to the satellite today is something that we have to prepare uh, days or weeks in advance 
Um, and so there is a lot of planning going on. And then when once we agree on what to ask the instrument to do, then uh, we 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 have to prepare those packets. So there there is a lot of steps. And then uh, and then when it's time, they can get sent. And but um, but then exactly as um, Bruno said, the satellites can really do a lot of things. So we can uh, we can we have many options, and we can ask him it to do. Uh, what we need. In 2030, the solar orbiter appears to hit Venus. Is this the end of the mission? Um, no. Um, solar orbiter does fly uh, by Venus every once in a while. And it does that on purpose. We fly next to Venus because we can use the gravity of Venus to give us a push. And we use that gravity push to to adjust our trajectory where we want to go next. And what we want, where we want to go next, is we want to go on top of the sun. We want to see the sun from above. And when we start off, we start flying uh, around the sun on the same on the same plane as the Earth is. But then we need to to tilt that plane upwards in order to be able to fly above the sun. And for that, we need uh, this gravity push from Venus. So every once in a while, every couple of years or so, we pass by Venus and we use that gravity to change our trajectory. Uh, and it might be that uh, w wherever you saw that information is finishing with our trajectory passing by near Venus, and it looks like we're going to crash into it. But I doubt very much that we will crash. We can, we can navigate quite good. And if we still have the fuel and the, the, the resources to keep doing our experiments, we will just continue. We'll fly by Venus and and do some more observations. Oh. Yeah, exactly. I think um, we we have, uh, on Sorabita, we have a plan for the mission, and then we have an extended mission plan. And I think uh, the 2030 is probably the end of what was planned so far, but uh, as the mission goes, we will re-evaluate uh, the possibilities. And so if there is, if the instruments are still working and if there is still fuel after that, we will continue uh, probably the mission uh, until, uh, until the end. And um, at the end, it's, uh, there, there will be a lot of discussion what to do with the spacecraft. Um, it's, I don't think, crashing on Venus is likely. Uh, we might try to get close to the sun, uh, even closer. Uh, and uh, if this is the end of the mission, you know, try to get as close as possible as the satellite may maybe start to melt and that we, we would get uh, in doing that you know, really new measurements as well for the end. For for the people that operate the satellite, this is like a horror scenario. Oh, burning our satellite, no. <laughs> But but it's uh, yeah it's a nice perspective. It's... That's interesting. So that means that when the sat when the, sat the satellite is burning up and nearing its end, it's also getting new and even closer measurements, which is kind of exciting as well. So Calvin, what's your next question? Uh, what do you find most fun about your job? Like, what's the best part about it? So. <laughs> Um, it's a difficult question because there are many exciting things in my <laughs> job, I think. Um, well, so what I like the most, I think, is uh, how diverse it is. Uh, every day is different and I got to do a lot of different things. So some days I'm working uh, on science, trying to understand how the universe is working and that's pretty cool but on other days i'm also working on uh, instruments uh, fixing problems um, with my hands and not my head no, like not just the computers uh, sometimes i have to um, talk with a lot of people and try to understand the problems from others and sometimes i also have to um, understand other projects and give my advice on things so it's really a lot of uh, interacting with many different people and on many different uh, projects and i think the, the diversity of it is really what's uh, the best part for me yeah um, it's also very interesting that we work with uh, with the new technology and space technology 
and it's 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 quite fun that we we actually get to be in contact with this robot which is many millions of kilometers away sometimes and uh, that's not many people in the world that can have such a job where you are talking to this machine somewhere in the universe good answer eh? yeah right Kevin all right here comes a very hard question oh no what is heliophysics oh i, I let sophie answer that <laughs> it's, it's really hard yeah. well heliophysics um is uh understand it's it's the physics so it's really to understand how things work and in this case how the sun work but how also it will influence everything around so influence the planets for example and the heliosphere is the space where the sun has an influence so heliophysics is that uh so that that you know you we try to, un to understand how the sun works but how also why it's um, producing gas that is then um, pushed towards the planets, that's called the solar wind. And we also try to understand how the planet reacts to that. Uh, and also sometimes we have solar eruptions, solar ejections, that we also um, interact with the planets, uh, especially the planet's atmospheres. And so understanding every step in those process is uh, making the heliophysics. So it's a lot of different scientific uh, questions here. Um, yeah. How many satellites do you control? Well, um, in, in, the, in the, my team, we control five satellites. That's Solar Orbiter and four satellites called cluster. Those four are flying around the Earth and they're also measuring the effects of the sun on the Earth. And the solar orbiter is flying towards, towards Venus closer to the sun. So we have five satellites. Um, but then in our division, so we are part of a larger group that flies more satellites. There we have also a satellite in Mars, uh, actually two satellites in Mars. And we have one going towards Mercury. Um, uh, these are the ones which also we are flying. And then we're preparing some other ones that will be launched soon. We're launching uh, in next year, we're launching another one to Mars and one going towards Jupiter. That's pretty far away. Um, and then at ESA here in Germany, where we fly all the ESA, all the European Space Agency missions, we still have more satellites. So we have then satellites that are looking at the Earth, and we have satellites we have big telescopes looking at the space. So in total, we have about uh, 23 satellites flying. 23 missions. That's a lot. That's a lot. That's a lot. And we still help out other people flying their satellites, like uh, the Galileo navigation satellites and some in telecommunications and meteorology. So, yeah, it's a lot. How, oh, How did you train to control satellites? Is there a driving test? A driving test? Um, no. There's not a like a driving test, but you do do need to learn uh, quite a bit. You need to train. So we, in order to train, so what we do is we create a simulator, and a simulator is pretty much like a computer game. It runs on a computer and it behaves like a real spacecraft, only that it's a fake spacecraft. But we can we can play with it the same way we would play or we would work with the real spacecraft and th and that's how we train on it so we can we can train how to send instructions we can train on how to read and understand what the satellite is telling us in return on the radio and we can uh, we can uh, uh, plan how we should be using the satellite and uh, and create new ways and new procedures to interact with the satellite so that's basically how we train and um, and in particular, when we need to do something very critical, like launching a new satellite, this very early phase, this very early hours of the life of a satellite, they're very critical. 
um, if something goes wrong there, we might not have a mission at all. So for those moments, then we, we do really major trainings. It's like, like a, training a whole football team. So we have a coach and our coach, we call him the simulation officer. He will prepare the scenario and he will prepare some failures. And then we have to go and cope with those. And, uh, and it's like we have to win the game. And the winning is making sure the satellite is healthy and can fly towards its destination and can do all the, the experiments and all the observations that, that the scientists want to do. So and that, there's a lot of training there involved. So it's just as hard as being in year six, eh, boys? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Right, what's the next question, Calvin? Um, can you voice activate it? Voice activation? Uh, no, not yet. So you can't say, Alexa, take a photo of the sun? Not yet. <laughs> but uh, thanks for the suggestion. We might start considering it. I mean, yeah, some things we need to to still evolve in uh, becoming more modern. There are definitely things out there that, that are quite nice. Alexa would be, Alexa, take a picture, yeah. Thanks for the suggestion, well, I'll take a note. Yeah, I'll, if you don't mind, I'll take your idea and uh, make a note here. So maybe I'll, uh, voice activation. Thanks, Calvin. Um, will we be able to see the satellite from Earth? When it flybys the Earth. Sophie, what you, you think we might be yes, able to see I, them? I think so. Um, I actually had to check that. <laughs> uh, and uh, so the satellite will be very close, uh, as close, uh, I think it's uh, below or close to 400 kilometers, which is the height of the ISS uh, that we can see. So the ISS is the space station. Uh, International Space Station, and usually it's easy to see by eye uh, during the night. Of course, Solar Orbiter is a bit uh, smaller, <laughs> but we should be able to to see it because I think um, it will be close enough, and it will be on the night side. So um, yes, uh, but I think right now uh, some people like ESA are preparing a simulation to see how exactly where it will be and how we could see it. So. Maybe in the next few uh, months, uh, they will uh, provide us more, more details for that. Oh, that's so cool. I didn't know that. Yeah, me neither. And I think it's fantastic. <laughs> awesome. Um, how will scientists use this evidence of the satellite? Ooh, um, yes. Well, to uh, answer, we have many scientific questions to answer. And uh, what is really interesting with this satellite is it will provide measurements uh, very close to the sun. So it means the pictures will have like a very high resolution and we will see things that are very tiny in the sun that we couldn't see before. Also, as we said before, we will see the top of the sun, which uh, we were not able to see before. And that's also providing really new information. But on top of that, Solar Orbiter can also make measurements exactly where it is um, in, in the solar system. And so it's providing what we call in situ measurements, uh, just measuring the particles from the sun where it is. And that's also very new information to us because the satellite is very close to the sun. So we will use all of that uh, to, to try to test our predictions of what should happen um, uh, given our knowledge about the sun. Lots and lots of information they'll be using it for. Yeah. Um, right, did you have, I have one you, have, you got one more question? Callum, you got any more? No. No, so Callum, Callum's got the final question for you. Thank you. How long will it take to reach the sun? Um, so we already um, are close close to the sun. So it's, it's hard to tell because we are not going you know, into the sun exactly. Um, we, it took several months to get close to the sun and we are on, in an orbit where we periodically get far away and then go back close to the sun. 
and uh, this takes uh, a few um, a few weeks or months each time. So uh, we are on close approach um, every now and then, every I think every five or six months, uh, we are getting at close approach to the sun and then going back uh, uh, a bit further away and doing that again and again. Um, I don't know if there is any more you want to say, Bruno? Yeah, we, we, when we get close to the sun, we're even closer than Mercury is. So Mercury is, is the planet that's closest to the sun. And we get in, we get in even closer than Mercury is right now. That's that's quite close, and we get so close because that allows us to to uh, pass the sun with a velocity that is similar to its own rotation. So we can, as the sun is rotating and we're flying at that close, we can track f features on the sun over several days, and so we can uh, observe them carefully. Yeah. And that's very uh, that's something that's very interesting for scientists because looking at what's happening in one point on the sun for a long time uh, is something we could not do as well before, and so we are really excited about this. I have to tell you, I studied many years, you know, until I was 23 to be an engineer, and I started working in space and I started learning stuff about space and how you fly in space. But it wasn't until I actually played this game called Kerbal Space Program that everything that I was learning suddenly became uh, real to me. So I do play a game, it's called Kerbal Space Program, and there I, I learned a lot about flying in space because it's so realistic. The physics in there, they work just like in the real world. It's a kind of a smaller, smaller version of our solar system, but you can build rockets in there, and you can build satellites, and you can launch them into space, and you can do all the things that we actually do in space. All the maneuvering, all the all the pointings and things that we do out there in space with real spacecraft. So that for us, they, they're just like ghosts somewhere out in space that we don't really see. We just see a screen full of numbers. But in the game, you actually get to see the satellites in space, and you know in which direction you're going to fire your your engines, and so you can do all that. So yeah, try that game, Kerbal Space Program. And and there's another game by Isa called Mars Horizons. Um, yes, yeah, so I, I I learned about uh, Bruno's game um, maybe two two weeks ago. It was mentioned by some other Isa people. I think it's very popular. Uh, I never tried, but uh, when I heard the, you guys were uh, um, experts, maybe on the Mars Horizon, I was like, oh, I need to to try this one. So I I tried it two days ago, and I found it really really interesting and really realistic as well and as all the steps you need to uh, to do in a space agency um, and I think that's uh, definitely helping to get the big picture and uh, see all the steps uh, that needs to go into a mission uh, especially as um, usually as individuals we are involved in uh, one of the pieces of the puzzle right so i'm the part of a science team so i know a lot about uh, how we design an instrument on paper what what we want for science but then there are many things ha happening to make that happen uh, and to have a satellite in space and i was not necessarily um, involved in lo a lot in this process, so it was kind of, um, I didn't know exactly what was happening, and uh, I guess the, this kind of games can uh, can really help you to understand uh, everything that is uh, that needs to be considered uh, for a mission. So in that sense, yeah, that could uh, really be helpful. <laughs> well, I still have one question that I'm dying to know since the beginning of this interview. Which is, w which team do you support, Calvin? Um, uh, Liverpool. Oh, very good. Still enjoying the fact you were champions last year then. <laughs> <laughs> which is not going to happen this year. Oh, you're taking over now. <laughs> good team. Yeah. It's also red. I... Thank you for your time answering our questions. No, thank you for interviewing me. This has been an honor to be interviewed. Yes, and uh, thank you, I think, for preparing this. 
so well. I think you had very, very good questions. So thank you a lot for that. Absolutely. Thank you very much for your time. It's been fantastic. And we um, we did it by having a group of year five people as well. And um, that's, that's NASA calling, isn't it? I bet it's NASA. Yeah. Um, yeah, we we, uh, we we had some year fives work with us as well. So we had a group of children come up with the questions um, and they were really interested to learn about the solar orbiter. Um, and I have to say, I mean, these two boys in particular, they were quite fascinated by using the use of gravi the gravitational pull on the planets, weren't you? Um, to kind of slingshot around. At one point, they even started to plan what you could do in case it went off course. They started to say, oh, they could just use a, a gravity from another planet to put it back on the right course. So I think they... They might have careers in the European Space Agency one day. What do you think, boys? Yeah, I think so. Yeah.